Weeks at 12. The Night Beat starts right now. A new court filing results in a new major detail in the deadly crash near the KSAT studio. A mother killed, a driver accused of being drunk behind the wheel. Tonight we are learning the bar that driver left just moments before the crash. And we're also hearing what led up to a little girl's murder on Mother's Day. A six-year-old killed during a car show. Tonight her father explains the argument that led to that shooting. And Mother Nature is doing a pretty good job watering some lawns in and around San Antonio. The rain making its way out as severe thunderstorm watch continues to be moving along with it. Let's check in with meteorologist Adam Kasky for an update. Yeah, and actually a new update on that severe thunderstorm watch that it's canceled right now for San Antonio. Some locations far south of San Antonio, it's still in effect. But you look at the activity on the radar screen and it's all east of town, especially between I-37 and I-10 and even farther to the south, closer to Corpus Christi. This is all in closing in on Corpus Christi. This has been some very good, healthy, soaking, beneficial rain across South Texas over the past couple of days. We'll go over some of those rainfall totals coming up momentarily and really who saw the most and where the bullseyes were. But I do want to point out this one little shower that just popped up near Smithson Valley. This is pushing eastward. We'll see how long that can last. It's one lone little area of rain that has developed here within the last 15 minutes. Highly isolated in nature. The storm threat and the severe threat it's done with around San Antonio. So yeah, maybe one pop up shower just north of town, but that's it. This is all coming to an end for now. We do have some very noticeable changes to prepare for and expect into tomorrow. We'll talk about that along with a look at the rain over the aquifer, compare the rain to our drought monitor and look at the total. Some good news coming up, Steve. All right, thank you, Adam. A six year old killed her father now recounting the terrifying moments that led up to little Soraya Pettis dying on Mother's Day. It's a story we're continuing to follow. An arrest was made in the case, but the family tells the night team's Jaffney Gray they're not stopping until everyone involved is served justice. Tonight, we hear from Soraya's father. I will never forget the day I had to see my daughter in her mother's arms, not responsive. Julio Garcia and Cassandra Mendoza still reliving the nightmare that played out near Southwest 24th Street and West Commerce Street. He took his family, including their six-year-old daughter, Soraya Perez, to a car meet on Sunday, something they did often. She would tell her dad, look at the wheels, dad, they're big. Look at all the lights. She begged her dad to take her. That's what we did. She was out having fun. Garcia says that fun came to an abrupt halt as they were leaving the event. He says a driver blocked him in the parking lot. Before I knew it, I looked at my left hand side. People were banging on the door saying I almost hit the truck. I hit the truck. I remember someone opening up my door. Uh, they hit me. I was bleeding from the nose. Garcia says he knew he had to escape. All I can hear in the background is my daughter and my son saying, Daddy, please leave. I'm scared. In this video, you see people hitting and kicking their car before Garcia made his exit. The video doesn't show what led up to this. I do remember shots being fired. I counted it three to four shots. And then I heard Cassandra Mendoza say something hit her. He drove his family to this nearby gas station, not far from where the shooting happened. There, he learned Mendoza, who was grazed by a bullet, wasn't the only one hit by gunfire. She had Soraya in her hands, crying, saying she was hit. I seen so much blood, I thought it was hit from the neck. Soraya, a loving, happy little girl, died that night. You can't sit here and tell me, Mom, you're the best, Mom, I love you. I'll never hear that again. Andrew Elizondo was arrested for capital murder, but the family says they are not stopping until everyone involved is in custody. I want so much revenge, but I can't because I know my daughter would tell me to do it the right way. Chief William McManus did say that they are looking into more possible arrests for this case. Of course, if you have any information that can help in this investigation, you're urged to call police. Live at Public Safety Headquarters, Jaffney Gray, KSAT 12 News. Thank you, Jaffney. A bicyclist killed a woman accused of driving drunk, and now the bar alleged to have overserved that driver is named. 
A $20 million lawsuit names Cerveceria Chapultepec as the business the driver left before that deadly crash last month. The court documents were just filed this afternoon. The bar and restaurant is on the corner of St. Mary's and Elmira, less than half a mile from where 47-year-old Beatriz Gonzalez was killed. Gonzalez was on a sidewalk in front of Central Catholic High School while waiting for the rest of her cyclist friends back on April 7th. Police say 24-year-old Samantha Castillo jumped the curb and crashed into Gonzalez, who was then pronounced dead. Lawyers allege the bar served Castillo to the point she, quote, became obviously intoxicated and was a clear danger to herself and others, end quote. We have asked the business for a response to those allegations and are waiting to hear back. We will keep you posted. The issue of getting behind the wheel while drunk continues to be a problem even during this pandemic. Campaigns urge drivers to plan ahead or use a ride share app to make sure everyone gets home safe. The night team's Patty Santos, though, tells us how one woman is making sure victims of drunk drivers never find themselves alone. So we just want, all, want to always be able to provide a safe place um, for victims or, and survivors. Aziza Salama, volunteer resource specialist for Mothers Against Drunk Driving South Central Texas, says the pandemic did not slow down the need for services for victims of drunk drivers. Our biggest concern was that we were still having the fatalities, regardless of being in pre-pandemic or post-pandemic we were still seeing crashes, we were still seeing arrests. Numbers by the Bear County District Attorney's Office show there was only a slight drop in DWI cases between 2019 and 2020. Among eight different types of offenses combined, there were only about 1,400 fewer cases filed. Only one intoxication manslaughter case less in 2020 than in 2019. The number of intoxication assault cases remained the same compared to 2019. Going into quarantine around, you know, mid-March, I was thinking to myself, okay, well, we're going to see the numbers drop. Um, and, and, and they did to a certain degree, but not to where they should have been. Salama says even though bars were closed, people still had access to alcohol and some chose to make poor choices. To see people still continue to be just very careless and senseless about it and not realize that it really has a lasting effect on people they don't know or community, people, partners, it, it's just unfortunate. Very selfish. Salama herself knows the pain behind those selfish decisions. In 2016, her family was involved in a crash involving a wrong way driver. Her fiance and the wrong way driver were both killed. We really want our community to do better and think before they drive if they're drinking. She says, as awkward as it may seem, discourage a relative, friend, or neighbor to get behind the wheel. Patty Santos, KSAT 12 News. The pandemic also pushed back court trials involving drivers accused of driving drunk. That pushback also slowing down justice for victims. Any victims who need resources can call 877-ASK-MAD, M-A-D-D. A new policy coming to the Bear County Sheriff's Department and its Cadet Academy. The department will have at least one female instructor present during its cadet classes. The change hopes to lower the likelihood of sexual misconduct. It comes after multiple female students accuse their firearms instructor of improper conduct. In one case, this man, Toribio Gutierrez, a 23-year department veteran, accused of groping at least one student during shooting drills and making other improper advances. Gutierrez is currently on unpaid administrative leave. Sheriff Javier Salazar says they plan on firing him. Well, let's take a look at where we stand with coronavirus cases here at home. 125 new cases were confirmed today, along with nine deaths. That brings the total number of COVID-19 related deaths in Bear County to 3,400. Over in our hospitals, 210 COVID-19 patients are hospitalized. 68 are in the intensive care unit and 34 are on ventilators. More children are expected to have a chance to get the COVID-19 vaccine. Trials for the Moderna vaccine in children as young as 12 is underway. The FDA approved Pfizer's vaccine for children between 12 and 15, but some, including health officials in San Antonio, are waiting to hear what the CDC's Advisory Committee on Immunization Practices has to say. 
That meeting is set for tomorrow. Still, many parents are trying to prepare beforehand. One question some may be wondering is if kids should get the COVID-19 vaccine at the same time as their other vaccinations, or should you space them out? University Health provides the answer. The Advisory Committee on Immunization Practices recommends that you either receive the COVID vaccine 14 days before or 14 days after the routine immunizations are given. Now, if there's extenuating circumstances like an outbreak of, let's say, measles within the community or perhaps some sort of exposure to tetanus, then you can receive that particular vaccine sooner. We've also been following other questions parents had for their children regarding the vaccine. We have that article online at ksat.com. It's still ahead on the night beat foster care changing in Bear County. The contract conundrum playing out here at home coming up. And new video continues to come in, not only of the rain that swept through San Antonio, but also the rainbows that were left behind. Cooler temperatures are expected tomorrow. We'll check in with meteorologist Adam Kasky for an update. And babies found on the border. All five girls traveling to the U.S. from Central America. The farmer who found them sharing his account. Next. Babies found on the border. A farmer found five young girls outside his property near Quemado, Texas. It comes as we've heard of children crossing the border alone to seek asylum. Congressman Tony Gonzalez shared a picture over the weekend of the discovery on social media. He says Border Patrol agents confirmed the girls are not hurt. They are healthy. Three of the girls are from Honduras, the oldest just seven years old. The two others from Guatemala, including an 11 month old baby. The farmer who found them says he brought them food and water and then called Border Patrol. During an interview with Gonzalez, he says it took two and a half hours before help arrived. I don't think they would have made it if I hadn't found them. Yeah, no. Because they got up to 103 yesterday. That's the part I don't people realize. It's about to get really hot. And, and that's going to be dangerous on anybody, more or less small children. Right. Senator John Cornyn and Representative Henry Cuellar have said a seasonal rise in border crossings have been going on for years. They expect to see more people cross the border before the summer season. The state of Texas will now take over managing the placement of foster kids in Bear County. The move comes after Family Tapestry, the division of the Children's Shelter responsible for its community-based care initiative, terminated its contract with the state. The Department of Family and Protective Services expressing disappointment in a statement and said, quote, we will work together to make this a seamless transition, end quote. Exact details for that transition remain unclear. It all comes after the state cited unacceptable conditions and capacity problems at the children's shelter. Placements were then put on pause. CEO Annette Rodriguez sent a letter to the state late last month threatening to end its contract unless they were able to agree to more favorable terms. The conditions included more money for certain types of care and less strict placement requirements. It's unclear when the contract between the state and the shelter will officially end. The flames spread fast, but lives were still saved. We have a night beat update on that large fire in Somerset early last month. Tonight, several volunteer firefighters recognized for their life-saving efforts back on April 11th when an apparent trash fire spread to homes and several cars. People were evacuated from their homes, and tonight we've learned an Atascosa Sheriff's deputy who was first on scene was pulled to safety after his car was trapped in the sand and then flames spread. Firefighters were able to reach him, placing a hook on his vehicle and then pulling him away from the fire. During tonight's ceremony, the firefighters were given a life-saving cross award. Those are heroes yes, right there. All right, live cam outside right now, 64 degrees. Certainly a calmer scene than just a few hours ago, Adam. Yeah, and it was nice. We didn't have a whole lot of severe weather, just yeah. a, a good amount of soaking rainfall with some hail involved, but most of it wasn't necessarily severe size. Here's some photos from today, and I love seeing these. Look at that bucket fill up from the runoff off the roof, and of course the yard there uh, where you can see the 
puddling of water instead of the type of dirt that gets the big cracks from the, you know, from the drought. Uh -uh, we're seeing ponding of water. It's nice to see. And of course, some good rainbows on the back side of this. We had sunshine mixed in after the rain. This is in Bernie. That's about two inches of rainfall in the rain gauge there along the fence line. And I saw similar readings elsewhere. That's a nice shelf cloud as that storm moved in, but the non severe portion of it. And that's about one and a half inches in the city of Atascosa, Texas, not Atascosa County, but in southwestern Bear County in the city of Atascosa. And that right there, water on the lawn. Isn't that nice to see? You don't need the sprinklers for quite a while again. Here's a look at the radar right now and most of the activities far east of San Antonio. Not a whole lot left to it. A few rumbles of thunder, a little bit of lightning out there, but that's it. We do have one little storm or shower more like it that popped up west of New Braunfels. This is moving eastward about to hit green and New Braunfels and then move its way across I-35. It's just an extra heavy downpour and that's all we have pretty quick moving at about 20 to 25 miles per hour. Could have a little bit of lightning associated with it here momentarily, but for the most part, that's an anomaly around Bear County and surrounding counties. The vast majority of the rain is along the coastal plain and it's just good soaking moderate rainfall, light to moderate rain. The heavy action and the severe activity is closer to Corpus Christi, especially Kingsville area down toward Falfurius. This is all pushing off to the east. That's where the real heavy action is right now in this beautiful. Don't you love to see this, especially after what we had last week? Then you look at this. And this is just rainfall estimates from the Doppler radar over the past couple of days. And what really stands out are the accumulations south down I-35. That's where we need the rain the most, according to the drought monitor. And here's the drought monitor for you. See this red area, McMullen, LaSalle counties down into Webb County. That's where we have the extreme and exceptional drought and where we really need the rainfall the most. Now let's put the radar on top of this. I love this. This is good news. So you look at the colored areas. I got in the way here. I'll play it for you again. Uh, you look at the colored areas and the red, especially covered by rain over the past 36 hours. Here we go. Just take this in. In that beautiful to see and elsewhere, of course, where we needed the rain, we got some shower activity. The aquifer, we love to get the rain right there in the purple zone. That's the recharge zone. Also in the red up in the hill country, the drainage zone. And look at the radar today. This was nice. We had some good heavy rainfall right where we need it for the Edwards Aquifer and the J17 well. So we'll see that respond tomorrow. A few hit or miss light showers. That's about it. We get into the weekend. That's when some thunderstorms should be coming back into the picture. Scattered activity Saturday, Sunday, Monday possible. Maybe some severe weather will keep you updated. Too early to tell right now. But the way this spring has been going in our pattern, wouldn't surprise me if we get some severe weather. 65 now, 67 Pleasanton, 63 in Kerrville tomorrow morning. 50s in the hill country, low to mid 60s elsewhere. By the afternoon tomorrow, near 70 degrees. But parts of South Texas will be stuck in the 60s all day long. With cloudy skies, a breezy north wind at 10 to 20. And again, a few hit or miss light showers isolated in nature. Thursday, Friday, quiet, drying out a bit near 80. Then again this weekend. Looks like we could see more rounds of thunderstorms. We'll keep you updated. All right. Thank you, Adam. All right. Spurs are already on their last road trip of the regular season in the Big Apple as we speak. In fact, they left a little early today to avoid all these thunderstorms. And when we come back, what lies ahead? Just four games left in the regular season starting in New York City. We'll get you ready. And signing day at Madison High School was a very big deal <laughs> coming up. Our San Antonio Spurs are in New York for their final road trip of the season. That's after they came through with a statement victory over one of the beasts of the East, the Milwaukee Bucks, anchored by the reigning most valuable player, Giannis Antetokounmpo. This victory came just 10 days after the Spurs blew a 32-point lead in Boston. Doing so, snapped the Bucks' five-game win streak. It started with a Triesta, led by Patty Mills and Rudy Gay, combined for 9 out of 15 from three-point range. In doing so, the Spurs set a franchise record by scoring 87 points in the first half, tied another record for most three-pointers in the first half with 12. DeMar DeRozan would lead the Spurs at 23, followed by DeJounte Murray's 21, and then Patty Mills and Keldon Johnson with 20 each in the 146 to 125 victory. It was a good night against, you know, a hell of a team, you know, championship caliber team, well coached. Uh, we have to be just thrilled with it, uh, but not too satisfied. And, you know, we're still in a big battle. 
we know, you know, coming back after a long away stretch, you know, usually coming home, we don't really play up to a, um, the level that, that we usually can play to. But we know these last few games mentally, we got to lock in. So um, I know everybody um, was, was ready to play against Milwaukee. We, we gave up one at, at their home and we knew, you know, coming here, we had to pick it up. You know, they're a great team. So we had to play the best of our capability and we just came up with the win. All right, tip time tomorrow. Brooklyn is going to be at 7 o'clock. The countdown continues this week for the induction of Tim Duncan into the Naismith Memorial Basketball Hall of Fame this Saturday. Duncan lead the Spurs to their first ever championship alongside David Robinson in 1999. In fact, the Admiral will be Tim's presenter this Saturday at the Mohegan Sun Arena in Connecticut. David would stand alongside Tim for another title in 2003. And then the big three of Duncan, Ginobili, and Parker would take it the rest of the way with three more, 2005, 7, and 2014. Spurs guard Patty Mills came to the silver and black in 2011 as part of the championship team in 2014, but more importantly, he was Tim's teammate for five seasons before Duncan retired in 2016. Mill says he's always admired Duncan's professionalism when it came to how he approached the game. And that's probably a big, the biggest thing that I've learned um, in, in this environment was from him in particular um, about how professional you got to go about things both on and off the court. Um, you know, for, for me, it was such a privilege to be able to witness that firsthand um, and, and learn from, from him at the same time. Um, you know, very, very, very grateful in that respect. Um, you know, and he, he'll obviously go down as an all-time great um, and, and proud to be, you know, be known as a teammate with him. And the Spurs have put together an experience and photo walk for fans starting on Thursday, the AT&T Center, as Tim enjoys his enshrinement. Signing day at Madison High School next. First meeting the San Antonio Quarterback Club this season has new location, the Shira Hills Baptist Church. And look who's their first guest, UTSA head football coach Jeff Trailer, coming off a very successful first season as Roadrunners coach, leading his team to a 5-2 Conference USA record, seven-win season, only their second bowl appearance in team history. Can he top that this coming season? We were in every ball game, uh, so we're not far away. Uh, we just got some, a couple of places on the roster we got to fix recruiting-wise, and we think we've addressed that in the offseason. And uh, need to stay healthy in certain positions. And, of course, you know, football can bounce some crazy ways. A little bit of luck along the way always helps. All right, good luck to Coach Trailer. Big day at Madison High School. As many as 13 Maverick student athletes signed their letters of intent in a huge ceremony today. Among those telling us where they'll play their college ball, Siobhan Respondic, who will play volleyball for Texas Lutheran University. Julia Pinzone headed to Texas A&M San Antonio for softball. And Mia and Olivia Wildeman. Mia will play soccer at Nebraska, while Olivia will play soccer for Upper Iowa University. I like the community there. It was a real nice school. I love the people there. It really felt like home to me. I really can't wait for my future there. Um, I'm very excited to see, I guess, how the team works, and I'm very excited to be a part of it. I visited the campus, and I loved it. And also, it's when I go in, it's going to be their second year, just having softball as a sport in general. So just having that and making history for the school. And congratulations to the Alamo Heights girls golf team that won the state championship today, led by Julie Vollmer, finished third overall individually. And a celebration of life is being planned for former UTSA University of the Incarnate Word head basketball coach Ken Burmeister. Ken passed away on March 19, 2020 at the age of 72 after a bout with cancer. But due to the COVID-19 pandemic and shutdowns last year, his family decided to wait a year so that they could honor coach. Ken Burmeister was a college basketball coach for 21 seasons, his best known for his stints in San Antonio. Coach Burmeister posted 72 wins at UTSA from 86 to 90, leading the Roadrunners to their first ever NCAA tournament appearance, and later in a Carner Word, where he roamed the sidelines for 12 years. And that life celebration will take place on Monday at 10 a.m., Community Bible Church. A lot of families were put in this position last year, and I'm glad to see they're able to do this for kids. Well, and he's a coaching legend in, in San, San Antonio. Antonio. Sure is. So, yep. yeah. Thanks, Greg. We'll be right back. Never miss a story. Watch live or when you want. San Antonio's latest news and weather, streaming free on KSAT TV. Tomorrow, cloudy. Most of the day spent in the 60s. Some locations will briefly get into the low 70s, especially southwest of town. And also a few hit or miss light showers. Then into Thursday and Friday, quieter, gradually making our way into some sunshine, low humidity, near 80 degrees on Friday. And then this weekend, we're not looking at any excessive heat anytime soon. Just more thunderstorms coming back into the picture scattered in nature this weekend and even into early next week. And of course, we'll keep you updated on severe potential as well. Yeah, let's hope they're all like today's, which is yeah. wide beneficial rains. We'll see you tomorrow. Good night.